very special recording of Work and Life podcast at X Day. Um, we are really, <laughs> we're really excited to have you um, on with us today. Uh, it is our season three, and we're almost wrapping up season three. We just have a couple more episodes left, and this is something that Maddie and I have been doing over the whole year. It's been fun. We've had a lot of learnings, um, and we just thought, hey, it would be pretty cool if part of this event, we invited some of you behind the scenes so you see how the podcast is being recorded, all the you know things that go on. It is a super relaxed podcast, so um, whenever our guests come in and they ask us, like, oh, do you do editing? Do you do all this different stuff? We don't. <laughs> it's just completely natural. You know, what you see is what you get. Um, we do have different data points, and today, like, we got a lot. We got really, really excited about our topic. Um, we do have a super special guest already on with us. I'm going to formally introduce her on the podcast because this is still behind the scenes. We're still not recording. Um, so I won't introduce her twice, but we're just super excited to have her on. She is a dear friend. Um, we've been having conversations, pulling data around what's going on in the labor market, what's going on with people, what do people want? And so it's been inspiring, invigorating, um, and just we're looking forward to a really, really great conversation. We also have Gia Santana. She's behind the scenes already. She is our head of marketing for Workforce, and she does all the magic of making sure that everything is run, running smoothly, that our data makes sense, that we're communicating effectively, that we get published when we need to, where we need to, that we get like, people excited about what we're doing. Um, I try to convince her a little bit to see if she would be you know, in front with us um, as we show you all behind the scenes. But I think logistically, because we're recording inside of an event, it was probably a little risky for her to do that. Um, so with that, shortly, we're going to jump into the recording again. Maddie will do introductions. We'll do introductions of already. Everybody that's listening to the podcast might even not even know that this is happening during X day. We will see if we, you know, mention it or we don't mention it during the recording. Like I said, sometimes, you know, we do things on the fly. And what we'll do is we'll hang tight afterwards in case anybody has any questions um, about any of the information that we discussed. So we'll pop into the recording. We'll go for... I won't even dare say 20 minutes because I know it won't be 20, 30-ish maybe. <laughs> we'll aim for 30, you know, plus or minus some. We'll go through um, the different data points. And then again, if you want to hang out with us afterwards, we can ask, you know, answer any questions that you might have or um, have a chat or feel free to go. It's completely up to you. Maddie, is there anything you want to add before we jump into the recording? Not right now. I'm just excited to, to be here. Um recording this during X Day. I think this is awesome and a nice way to have people kind of in the room with us, you know, and hopefully you'll stick around, you know, after we uh, finish recording the podcast. And like Sonia said, just to answer or, or ask a few questions and, you know, keep the conversation going. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, Gie, over to you to get us counted down and get us started on the podcast. Everybody and welcome to Work at Life, um, where we talk about the gray area between work and life. And in this season three of our podcast, uh, we are super excited to be talking about what we're calling the great opportunity. So everybody's heard of the great resignation. Well, oh no, we are going to be optimistic and, and talk about all of the different ways that we might find some positives um, out of what is happening in the world. So I am Maddie Grant. I'm a culture designer at Propel, and I'm here with my beautiful co-host, Sonia Lucina, and I'm going to turn it over to her to introduce herself and our super special guest today. 
Thank you so much, Maddie. It's always so fun to, to do these shows and these episodes with you. So my name is Tanya. I'm an organizational psychologist, eternal optimist like Maddie, and president of the Workforce <laughs> Business Unit at Question Pro. And today we have just the most incredible pleasure of having Artie Pollins as our guest. And um, I asked Artie to send me a couple of sentences as a form of introduction because I said I will I mean I will talk about her forever she is such a dear friend we've had so many life experiences together I love her to pieces so without further ado I'm going to introduce her formally and then um, turn over the mic to her and then we just have such amazing data and thoughts and everything to to share with you today so Ardi is a data-driven entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in leading business strategy, product innovation, and end-to-end -end business deployment and technology. Throughout her career, Ardi said has architected and led over half a dozen tech-led businesses towards successful growth and exits, including businesses in India, China, and Europe. And currently, she's in the United States. Um, Ardi is the CEO of Funded Consultants. She started her career in HR tech, and today she focuses on digital health and health AI and is a leading startup investor and advisor to tech startups in Chicago. Artie has her executive MBA from Kellogg at Northwestern University and went to Michigan State University for her undergrad. Yay, welcome, Artie. Welcome, welcome. Artie's Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, so today know, our um, topic. Yeah, yeah. Go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. No, since we are live, <laughs> I'm having some live issues, so we will just deal with it. We'll just go with it. <laughs> no worries. It will be no show without live issues. I've gone. I, I was mentioning um, earlier today. I had a meeting, and right when it ended, my internet died. And I, and at that moment, I thought, no. And then I thought, wait. I'm kind of lucky because it was right after the meeting. So I'll take it as a win as, you know, I'm trying to like architect, like with my screwdriver, what might be going on over there. Uh, so we will roll with it. Don't you worry at all. We've seen worse, <laughs> I'm sure. So in our preparation conversations for, for this show, um, we've, the three of us just had so many ideas, so many different topics, so much data that we wanted to look at. And I know, Artie, you had mentioned, especially in, in some of your conversations with your family and your dad, um, you had come up as this, you know, what is this chapter of our lives? And you talked about it as the people revolution, because it's something that's so incredibly big. And I think it can be even bigger, depending, like, now we have this ability to put it in our hands and see, you know, what kind of actions do we take out of this? people are growing, they're changing their minds on, on what they want to do. And so uh, before we jump into the data, and we have so much, so I'll turn to it, we'll start, get started with it in a second. Um, just wanted to, you know, get your perspective on what, when you were thinking about the people revolution, what were the conversations that you were having? And how did that come to mind? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> And, you know, it has been very interesting. Obviously, people are leaving their jobs. They have been trying to have a different way of looking at their career and their outlook of opportunities. And just like you mentioned, I was having this deep conversation with my father maybe about a month and a half ago. And we started to think about how you go through or us as a culture or a society, we have gone through all these different revolutions, these big moments, right? You have the industrial revolution and the manufacturing one, and they happen to have these larger ones every hundred years, and then you have subsections on them every 30 to 35 years. And I feel like that's what we are going through from a people and a skill set and an opportunity standpoint. So I'm with Maddie. I don't like calling it a resignation or a recession or a regret. I think it's an opportunity where people and all of us as employees, even as employers, we are saying, hmm, what do we really want to get out of this in the people revolution? What does it mean to me? my family, my kids, my, my community. And 
you know what, how do I reset it in a way, the right way? And I think we're all learning, learning through that. And it's causing this big, big change that's happening, which is very exciting, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. And so to go to just jump into one data point, because I, I'm thinking like if we don't, if I don't start rolling through them, we're never going to get through all of them. So um, again, as, as we were having these conversations and as you're talking about this change and, and people changing themselves, one of the questions that we asked is how much has the pandemic changed your perspective? What's when, what's important to you in life? And what we found out is that 43% said it's it's made an extreme impact. It's it's just really greatly changed and 26% said somewhat. So between those two, 69% of people said that the pandemic had an impact on what was important to them in their life. And I mean, that that is huge. It's, it's more than two thirds of people. It's so all of these individuals are really thinking, reevaluating. I think that you know, when we were having the conversation, like what you're seeing and what your perception is, I think that this was just a really, really strong way to quantify that, just how many people are actually going through it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you think of any market, any industry, um, any tenure level, you're seeing those changes happening. And, and a lot of it is driven because of this, right? 20, the last 24 months, 18 months, all of our lives have been flipped upside down, um, totally where we have had to figure out how to work from home, how to have our kids running around, our pets, our, our family members running around in the background, right? What's more important? How do I value, how do I associate value? And I don't mean monetary value. I mean value of what whatever is important to you as a person into your career. And, um, and I think this has a lot to do with it. And it will continue to evolve. I don't think we'll have an answer tomorrow or the day after. Sorry, employers who are trying to figure out how to hire great talent. Um, but I think this evolution of change and, and transformation when it comes to people deciding um, what is important in their life and how it is driving them forward, career being a big one, jobs being a big one, um, will we'll continue to change. So this, this data is extremely um, suggestive, in my opinion, of what we're all experiencing in the, in the market. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, I just want to mention also is that our data, um, I want to call it real time, but obviously it's not literally real time, but our sort of instant poll data goes out to several hundred U.S. workers, but those are all kinds of workers. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we get a lot of questions around, you know, is this just low level? Um, sort of unskilled workers, like, you know, we're hearing about people who work in fast food places who are just walking off the job because they can't stand it anymore. Um, or, you know, those of us who are lucky enough to work um, in sort of white collar, you know, um, kind of work where, where we can work remotely on a laptop and, you know, it's all sort of on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's actually, you know, our, our snapshots of this data is just across the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just something to bear in mind also, that it's just everybody, really everybody. Yeah. Well, and I think to me, like, this is also where when you start to think about, this is why research is so important because people are so different. And I think there's still categories of perspectives, but a lot of this, I mean, my, like as a researcher, my inclination is, okay, well, why? So how much has something changed? Like, well, what has changed? How has it changed? And a lot of, um, you know, what we're hearing in the news and talking with organizations is they're looking at flexibility and people are asking for flexibility and where they work and, you know, when they maybe work, but why? Like, what is it? Is it that, you know, I have commitments that I can move, can't move, that I realize now that it's, you know, my life's a lot easier, or is it that, I have realized how short life can be and how important self-care is and how important mental well-being is. And so I think, Maddie, to your point, too, it's almost like different organizations might take different actions depending on the type of workers they work with, depending on the culture they have, depending on, you know, I, I don't want to say like limitations they're working with necessarily, but in, in some cases, depending on the industry, like if you're customer facing and it's not necessarily that can be a virtual job. Maybe today you have some limitations on what you can do there, but I think to me it's there, this 
makes me want to like go back and like peel back the onion more, like understand really what's going on. What is it that people want? And one of the things that, you know, we've talked about a lot too, is that people's needs and perceptions are going to change. And so it's really important for organizations to continually ask, to continually understand, because likely even the whys and the people's needs today are different than what they're going to be in six months and are different going to be, you know, in a year. And so how do you create an organization that's agile enough that you're not always changing things, especially understand how difficult it is if you're a larger organization, um, but that you're really preventing making like static decisions that later can't be changed or it's yeah. much more difficult to change them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally, totally agree with that. I think this idea of, uh, um, both from an employer and an employee standpoint, it's really interesting to look at, you know, every day there's a new article, every day there's new news stories in regards to the demographic and the data of white collar, blue collar, hourly worker. It doesn't really matter. I focus a lot in healthcare, te health technology and life sciences. And the trend is exactly the same there, right? You can talk about burnout rates or um, mental health, but the, but the move had already slowly started pre-March of 2020 or February of 2020 when COVID really struck all over the, the globe at, a, at an immense rate. But I think that the opportunity is for employers and us as employees and hiring managers is to say, well, how do we craft a different story now? How do we yeah. regain, right? We were talking about regaining the power back, me as an yeah. employee versus being um, sort of in this box of nine to five or, you know, the 40 hours a week though I don't know who works 40 hours a week anymore, but 40 hours a week, right? And you kind of, th that change and that movement was already happening um, with gig economy, more and more people going freelancing, more people mm -hmm. wanting their freedom, work-life work balance. Um, so, so this is a really interesting time. We all remember the funny video of the CNN anchor, you know, who was doing his new story and his little beautiful child comes in and then the mom was dragging the kid out. I think Ooh. like those things are, you know, we won't laugh about that now. Mm -hmm. And and there won't be new stories about that. There might so be funny about how there's like that's everybody oh, now. Like, yeah. Right? What a change. Yeah. I th I I think it's 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 liberating um as as a both as a um in employer and um, somebody who has always worked remotely, even even yeah. sort of pre-pandemic, um, I think the idea of making it happen in your own vision of work, career, opportunity, growth, um, I think we're going to continue to see changes there in all, all sort of facets of career or labor market that we're in. Um, and it's not just a not just a domestic trend. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, that brings us to our the next question that we asked you as workers is, do you feel like you have a greater ability to craft your own working circumstances now than before the pandemic? And already to your point, it could be, you know, whether it's inside the organization, whether it's more opportunities as gig workers, as contractors. And what we found is that you know, between people saying absolutely and somewhat, it was more than half. 51% of people said that they feel like they have great abilities now to craft their working circumstances than before the pandemic. Now, it's not everybody. 28% of people still said not really or not at all. So it's not equal, but it's interesting um, just how many, like, this pandemic where in some ways like maybe if we were you know facing this 50 years ago people would have had the mentality of i'm just so glad to have a job and i'm so glad to have a paycheck and what else is out there that the circumstances around us have changed and people said you know whatever that different life is i don't want to continue like this anymore and that's that's exactly what we're seeing in the data is that you know we're seeing in the data and people changing jobs leaving jobs but also just in people's confidence you know even those individuals who who haven't made any moves yet how likely are they going to consider it? they finally feel like okay i have the ability to ask you know more transparently with more confidence for what i want yeah yeah no abs um absolutely i mean you, and you're seeing that 
um, across the spectrum, right? Maddie, earlier you brought up, brought up the idea about um, different type of jobs in, in, within the labor market. I was reading an article this morning in The Atlantic that was talking specifically, and I'll, and I'll quote here, but it was specifically talking about um, a restaurant and hotel workers and how in the month of August, um, the, the data is a little one month old, 7% um, of employees in accommodation and food services left the job force. That's like one in 14 workers in a hotel or a restaurant industry. I mean, that that is massive if you think of the trend, right, of what's happening. Yeah. And the, yeah. this article is really interesting. Um, maybe maybe we'll we'll post it after after our podcast. Um, but it's talking about that it's more of freedom um, from that type of restriction of jobs that we, for some reason, as a society, have been in. Um, and now we're saying, no, I don't want that restriction anymore. Um, and I much rather take my skills mm -hmm. into something that is non-restrictive to me and you know, that word restriction means different to, different to everybody, but it's it's sort of creating, continually con creating that trend. What I find interesting too is it, and we've talked a lot about empathy on this podcast, um, but the idea that this this affects, you know, everybody in in the hierarchy. So it's kind of been the great leveler to some extent just in the sense that even, you know, the CEO has to deal with their dog that's barking or, or kid that's running around in the background um, or, or, you know, whatever. So at least hypothetically, um, people at the highest levels can get or have as a result of this, a bit more of a sense of what everybody else is going through because they're actually human beings too and going through some of the same stuff, you know? So that's kind of been interesting to watch as well. Yeah. Well, and it, it's funny, I, I remember um, a study that was put out by Slack. I think it was, gosh, maybe at this point, like about a year ago. And what they were saying is they were going, they were doing not as just a study at Slack, but just in general, they have a research group. And one of their recommendations was that when you provide an option for employees that like, for example, that we don't expect you in the office all the time, that it's really critical for senior management to not be in the office all the time. Mm -hmm. Because if they are, you're saying one thing, but then you're doing something else. It's almost like, mandating them to say, you know, if this is what we stand at as a culture, we need you to also also show some of that flexibility or people won't be comfortable. And so Maddie, like one of the things that um, that based on what you were saying, kind of that triggered my thought is <laughs> I, as you know, I'm very optimistic and I want to change the world. And I think I think really good things are going to come out of this. I'm also very cautious that I don't want us to start, you know, for some of the people who are in leadership positions in more influential, powerful positions to start going back to the office and forget what it's like to have a dog barking at home, to forget what it's like to have a child at home. And so, you know, to continue to think about measure, evaluate, is that level of empathy still there? Because we're starting mm -hmm. to see some data that it's dropping. And that to me is alarming. And, you know, maybe should organizations say, okay, like, no, you as top leadership have to work from home one day a week, or you have to do this. Because I think that there's just a psychological principle that as much as we have good intentions, when we're not actively experiencing something, it's harder to relate to people who are. So I think that'll be an interesting practice um, for organizations to think about and put into play is again, we iterate how we work and think about these different things. What is your, and Maddie, I think this is actually a lot of the research that you and Jamie have done on cultures. And I'm, I'm thinking about the culture survey and even just the general different perceptions of organizational culture between the executive team and more of the front level employees way before the pandemic even existed. Like, let's not go back there. Let's not go back there. I'm sure some differences still exist. But like, <laughs> let's be very mindful and proactive in making sure that as much as possible, people in different roles at different levels are experiencing the culture in a more similar way. Yeah, I mean, we we talk about this every single day about <laughs> you know, really paying attention to this because I think, you know, the whole concept of the people revolution, like, what is that? Well, it's actually people taking power back by leaving, 
if something is really not acceptable, they're going to leave. And there's, it's sort of a snowball effect because since so many workers are leaving, that means that salaries are going up and, you know, like employers are having to find all to to retain um, and hire new people. So, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's only just started like in the U S you know, labor day was barely six, seven weeks ago. Um, you know, that was a moment when we thought a lot of people might start returning to the office, but then the Delta variant hit and everybody delayed till the early next year and, and the people that we talked to. So there's a lot of people who are still debating about, you know, how they're going to come up with their hybrid office plans and all that, which is great, but they have to keep this whole, you know, empathy factor, if we want to call it that like top of mind and really um, actually pay attention. It's interesting because I see, I see companies gathering data from their staff who say, oh yeah, I would much rather work from home, like at least four days a week, but then they almost ignore it. (laughs) They're like, well, I don't care about that because instead we should all work, you know, four days in the office and one day at home. Yeah, And it's almost like, you know, they're, they want to kind of go back to the way it was, but but like Jamie always likes to say, the toothpaste is out of the tube on this one. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I was gonna say that the genie's out of the box or Pandora, box, but right there, there's so many analogies. But I, 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 I hundred percent agree with you. I think employers are trying, and you, you can look at different industries, right? We were talking about the finance industry in the U.S. Um, and in the big financial institutions. JP Morgan Chase has come out and said, nope, once we all feel comfortable, we're all coming back into the office, we'll be in our buildings, none of this remote stuff. Versus um, Citibank and B of A and everybody, their main um, financial competitors, HSBC has said, no, we're gonna do the hybrid model and we're gonna use digital technology more to service our, um, our, our end customers as well as um, keep our employees happy. So. I think you're going to see um, this this sort of, I don't know, teeter-tottering, I guess. Maybe there's another analogy for us um, of what different tactics companies are using to create this flexibility um, yeah. for their people and even, the, even their customers, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, we are employees, but we're also a customer. We're also buying yeah. that product and that service. Uh, and I think that that mentality of us just being everything personalized, digitized, on demand, um, ready for us is transferring over onto the people revolution side um, of it. So this idea of greater flexibility, which is one of our next questions, right? Um, it, I I think it's too late. I don't think it can be shoved back in the well, toothpaste and- bottle or whatever. <laughs> Just to be clear, it's actually perfectly fine for J.P. Morgan Chase to say, no, everybody's coming back to the office, you know, because culture, a a really good, successful culture is all about um, putting in place the things that allow your employees to do their best work. So if J.P. Morgan Chase decides we want everybody in the office and our people do their best work in that environment, then fine, that's legit. However, <laughs> you might lose a lot of your people who got used to working from home and you just have to hire new people who actually maybe don't wanna be home. I mean, there's plenty of people yeah. who are like, I can't I can't deal with the kids and the dog anymore. I wanna go back to an yeah. office, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I agree. And it's that awareness from the employer not to be surprised. Like if you're, you know, attracting a certain profile or maybe it won't hurt your diversity efforts, or maybe it will, because some people can, you know, it's easier for them to come in the office. If you're an organization where diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is really important, but you don't want to have more flexibility, you might just realize that on some of these other organizational goals, you have to work even harder. And that's, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, now flexibility and earlier in the show as well. And, you know, one of our questions was, how likely are you to stay with your employer if you had greater flexibility where you did your job from? So this was just where, not even when and where. And 76% were 
said either extremely likely or somewhat likely to stay with their employer. So even just saying, I feel like you're hearing me and I feel like you're open to making changes based on my needs makes me more likely to be committed to you. I think, again, stresses that dialogue and that clarity around like what both of you are saying is like, this is the organization that I am. This is what I stand for. And either I will give flexibility or I won't. But if I won't, I need to be clear of the repercussions and the talent that I'm attracting that based on the data we have now, it'll be a much smaller pool. Yeah. And if you're the, or the organization that are that is saying, I guess I'm more willing to have this two-way dialogue. I'm more willing to change, to attract the right people to my organization. Then it's more of the awareness of you know, how frequently do you have it? What questions do you ask? How deep do you dig in to understand the reason behind some of these answers? So that way you're, you really have the best information as you're making some of these strategic decisions. But it's, you know, in some of the research that we did before, it's like the opposite, like, you know, 75% of people say they're open to changing jobs right now. And then 76% of people said, ah, but if I'm giving flexibility, I'm more likely to stay. So I, I think that that, those statistics really speak volumes. Yeah, yeah. I think the other piece of flexibility, and it showed in some of our data and the research we were also doing, is um, this idea, and, and it it's part of flexibility, right? This idea of previously, if I lived in a smaller town um, or a remote area, part of even the United States, let alone internationally in different parts of the of the world, mm -hmm. right? My opportunity was restrictive because either I had to move or eventually I had to make, make that change for that job. I think mm -hmm. part of the flexibility norm that's happening as well is you can you you can live in a smaller town and still have the opportunity for those great resources or in a different country. Um, and still be <laughs> broadcasting live, um, right? And and sharing um, um, sharing great great skills. So uh, yeah. I'm I'm pretty excited to continue to see that norm, um, yeah. Sort of continue to to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think it broadens the possibilities and it allows us to dream a little bit more. Like some things that. Like to your point, Artie, like we're sitting here and for those, you know, who are maybe listening to our show for the first time, I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. <laughs> you know, how wild is that? And and I get to, you know, virtually connect. And if I didn't mention that, you might have no idea where I am. You might have tried to ask my, you know, guess my accent. You would have no idea that I'm Serbian. Um, but it's, it, 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 and then it starts to make you think like, if this is possible, what else might be possible? Where am I willing to take a chance? Where am I willing to be more courageous? And I think that's that's the only way that we're going to start to make some of these profound shifts. Like some of us are, you know, going to have to step out and, you know, take a risk and say, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Both on the individual level, but on the organizational level, because as much as, you know, I chose personally to live in a different country, Question Pro allowed me to thrive in a role where they could have done a lot of things to make it very difficult for me and they didn't. And so I think is this, you know, a little bit of a, all the way, a two way street and, and testing and, um, you know, trying out different things. And I'll, I'll jump to our next data point because this is one that'll um, segue nicely in our conversation. And I think it was one of those like shock factors at first. And then it, it actually made sense. The more we originally talked through the data is, the next question we asked is, you know, if you were to look for a new job tomorrow, what is the most important factor you would consider? And there's a lot of talk about freedom and flexibility and values and purpose and all of that, which is incredibly important. But when forced to choose the number one factor, 48% um, of our respondents said that salary would be the most important factor they consider. And the reason why we wanted to stress that is that although I think the three of us will be the first ones to advocate that it's not enough and don't stop at that, that it's a really important factor for organizations to understand that it's something that they still can't undermine or undercut as they're competing for talent. That you know, by and far, the way that the world and society is set up most people still earn their income, support their you know families, their basic needs through an income from a job. And so um, 
Um, Maddie, already, I'll, I'll let you comment on this information, but it just, Maddie, you and I have asked it before, and I feel like almost every time we're like, oh, we're like, okay, no, but it makes sense. <laughs> but you kind of think maybe it'll be different. I don't know if you hope it'll be different, but then the, the reality comes back at this. So I think as, as organizations are thinking about what is my employer brand, what is my value proposition to both my current employees, but also for people that I'm looking to attract, um, this is just the really important point not to not to set aside or forget about. Yeah. Actually, there's a, a great comment from Carlos in the chat who says yeah. the flexibility is the biggest factor nowadays. I'd even take less salary for the power of deciding where and how to work. Yeah. I mean, that's so true for so many people. And yeah. actually, I'm getting this question a lot about like where we see the whole salary issue going because um, just recently, somebody was saying um, that they they want to move, um, and their employer said, "Well, if you move to this different place, um, you have to take a pay cut because the cost of living is lower over there." Mm-hmm. And they were like, "Well, I thought my salary." was based on my do my job like what i bring to the table as a worker like what what Mm -hmm. is where i live have to do with it at all right Mm -hmm. and and i just i wasn't sure really what to say to him because i mean it's all in flux right now but do you guys think that that it won't matter where people live like do you, or is, do you think it's just going to get worse before it gets better in terms of this salary issue you know it's it's interesting i think so you you can you can break up the market if you think about the tech world that we thrive in and live in and i'm i'm a i'm a techie person right that's my my background um tech has been overly inflated when it comes to comp and salaries and maybe a lot of that is because of this whole situation of You got to live in one of the coasts in the United States and they're both uberly expensive. There's not a lot of land mass out there. So we're literally like living on top of each other and and real estate prices are absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Your cost of living goes up, but not in, in for years we have been talking about, it's kind of crazy. Like you cannot Mm -hmm. expect a, you can't just keep inflating wages on one side or the other side of the country and not in the Midwest or, or in the rest of the country. But more importantly, you, you also just prices of everything else, cost of living can't keep inflating that way. Right. The, the word bubble keeps coming up over and over again. Um, so I think there will be an equalization, um, but it'll take some time because, Maddie, you made a great point earlier. Now there's a labor supply and demand issue. So now Mm -hmm. this exact same question, right, um, is going to get exuberated even more because there is a power to the people advantage, right? We have the ability to go and say, nope, I want this and I want this. And if you're right for the job and the right skill, your employer is probably going to do whatever within norms, um, right, to, to, to make it happen. So I think until there's eventually there's going to be some normalization. Um, we are seeing yeah. the same trends in healthcare uh, pretty significantly. Um, in the the salary, in the comps, in the um, in the overall compensation, it's just going through the roof. That it's never been that way. But it'll equalize. The pendulum will swing to normality. The yeah. the great question is. When, if we all had a crystal ball, <laughs> ah, I am. Well, well, and I think for me, I think it's such a complicated question. But what, like, a couple of like layers, and so I don't, I don't have the answer. But some of the points of consideration. So let's say, like, I, you know, I was living in San Francisco, and I decided to move to, I don't know, somewhere Idaho. What is the cost of living? And then what happens to the organization when they hire the next person in Idaho, like in Boise, and the transparency behind pay and how much is the cost of living in each area? So if I was making, I don't know, I'm making it up like $300,000 in San Francisco, but my rent was $5,000 a month, and then I took $300,000 and I went to Boise, and now my rent was like $1,000 a month the money that I'm putting away is very different. Like the the groceries, the bills, like all of that is very different. 
And then what does an organization do when they expand? Do they just pay everybody the same, no matter where they are based just in the position? And then they say, you know, it's your, it's your responsibility to choose where you want to live. We value this position at this much money. And it might not be enough for you to live in New York, but that's your decision. We'll still offer it to you. I think that could be risky from a supply and demand standpoint, because you could really make a lot of people happy where the cost of living is lower, but you could isolate a lot of the higher markets. And that's why I think what we're seeing, at least publicly, a lot of organizations don't know what to do yet. Like some are saying, when you move, we're going to match your cost of living to the place where you're living. Other organizations are saying, no, you know, I will let you have your salary and you can live wherever you want. I think a part of that, what I wonder is going to be organizational size. It's going to be maybe somebody saying, you know, Maddie already are valuable enough to me. And so if that's what they're asking, I'm willing to give it to them. And I know that maybe, you know, I'll have transparency challenges if I go to a different market and somebody else knows, but um, I think it'll be tough. Like, I think that I, I wonder almost if that's something that's going to be like grandfathered in, but as organizations continue to hire, I just wonder how sustainable it is only because, and we're just thinking about the U.S. If you think yeah. about the global market, that becomes wild, like totally wild. <laughs> well, and the great resignation is global. It's not just the yeah. U.S. So, Mm-mm. so yeah, this whole, this whole topic really hurts my brain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. And I know like Ari, you asked a question around like, you know, could organizations hire globally and what would that mean? You know, what would that mean? And today there's some like legal things you have to go through and you you maybe can't just randomly hire somebody somewhere else. Maybe you need to create an entity. I don't, there are things, but if organizations, if the supply and demand continues to move that way, organizations are going to become more and more resourceful. And I wonder if like countries are going to become more open because if they're like, well, if I, you know, if I have external organizations wanting to pay people inside my country, like, hey, why not? Like that's wealth coming in here that the person is going to spend locally. So it is, it is incredibly complex, but I think that's where, again, that conversation with the talent is going to have to be so important to understand. And then also like how uniform, uniformly do we make a decision versus how much do you start to, you know, make some exceptions. And and also like this will be our, our last data point because I, I think it's interesting because it goes right along with, you know, the conversation is we also ask people how comfortable they feel negotiating their salary now compared to how they felt before the pandemic. And 52% of people, more than half, feel more comfortable negotiating a salary now. Like 35% say they feel much more comfortable and then 17% somewhat, but overall it's 52%. The reason why this is important is that, you know, especially for employers to know they're more than likely, especially if they make a decision without having those conversations and that input, that the sentiment is not going to be, well, okay, I understand it's just company policy. It is what it is. People are much more likely to come back and be like, wait a minute, like this is where I stand. And, you know, maybe you won't loosen up, but I at least want to have this discussion. It's not like, oh, okay, that's what it is. I'm, you know, I'm grateful to have a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's the whole people revolution, right? I think yeah. <laughs> people are more comfortable, at least hypothetically negotiating, um, is yeah. that they know that, that everybody, like the pe- power of the people is behind them. And, you know, people are really are leaving their jobs for jobs that pay better or let them be more flexible or whatever the reasons are. But the point is you have lots and lots and lots of people doing that now. So it's not just you all by yourself, like being like, please, please, can I have more money? You know, <laughs> it's yeah. actually like, you know, I want to be pay- paid what I'm worth for doing this work. Yeah. And I achieve these results and I work really well, no matter where my laptop happens to be and, you know, et cetera. Um, so I think, I mean, it's almost like to, wrap a a bow around this whole topic it's like we really like you were saying Sonia and Artie it's like we have to really keep pushing this and not let this power go right like yeah well and I wonder a part of it so like I I'll sound kind of naive saying this I get that but Artie and I went um, to Kellogg together and I remember 
I oh negotiation is just not my thing. Like it's not, and I I'm, I need to get better at it. And I think over the years I have, but we had a phenomenal actually international negotiations class. And I remember you know we were talking about BATNA as the best alternative to you know the desired outcome and and win wins. And I think that you know our people departments, HR departments can take such an incredible page out of that book because I think what we need to desperately like our life depends on a look for in here is what's the win-win what's yeah. the win for the organization and win for the person because now it feels like a little bit like a pull like yeah. and, you know at first like oh i was just like you know the or the employer had the power and i felt lucky to have the job and now it's like wait now i feel like supply and demand powers and i but but i, I do feel like there's got to be a much better situation where we can have that win-win so it's not we're not talking as much about the power shifts but we're talking about what does that individual really need? Like Carlos was saying, like for a lot of people, it is flexibility. For a lot of people, it is still pay. Like for organizations to understand that trade off and say, okay, like this is what I'm, this is also successful for me is that I think this person's here, but they're so incredibly committed to the organization. They're so incredibly passionate. And I don't think I can find that somewhere else. So yeah, I'm going to be okay with that. And, and maybe, you know, doing it in some kind of scale, but doing it, maybe more personalized than we had before because maybe the win-wins will just have to get more personal to figure out what they are. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet, but I think it would be a good good kind of um mental like map or you know way road to go down. Yeah. Well and yeah. of course I always fall back on culture too. And part of the culture mm -hmm. side of this from an organizational perspective is being able to share more like what you know, what our organizational concerns are and, you know, why we can't pay everybody, you know, the maximum and, you know, mm -hmm. what, what other effects that mm -hmm. has, you know, there's, yeah. there's lots yeah. of things that can be shared that just aren't yeah. shared these days. Yeah. And, and then you can find that win-win so much better. Yeah. But anyway, I know we're like, I'm sure we're, we're over time. So <laughs> always, but I wanted to give Artie the last word on this before we wrap it up. If you have like a, a key takeaway or something you would like, you know, everybody to remember, you know, as we close this out. Well, I, you know, my key takeaway, and I think we, we've, we've discussed this during the last, you know, 40, 40 some minutes is, um, Mm -hmm. I am also an optimist. I also like looking at glasses half um, full and not empty, and this is not bad. I feel like it's not so much of the negative of the resignation, the recession, the reset. I have like lots of R's written down here on my, <laughs> on my book, and it's not just words I made up. It's, it's what's in the news and be, being publicized. I think we have an opportunity, I truly do, at a global level, to literally change the way history will look at how people moved from one end of the way we worked and the way our employers looked at the working employees throughout throughout up and down the scale into what, what comes in this great economical shift that's happening now of all the things that we talked about. Um, and I am pretty excited about the people revolution and the change happening because of it. Um, and I'm excited to see what, what continues to continues to happen in regards to it. So no negativity, mm -hmm. all positivity. I love it. I think, <laughs> I think it's great. And um, I think in the next two years, maybe do this podcast again in a 12 month period and yeah. we say, Oh, wow. Ladies, what, what we talked about. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Artie. Um, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, everybody at uh, Question Pro X Day who's watching us uh, record this podcast today. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Sonia, do you have any closing thoughts? No, just thank you so much. Thank you, Artie. You're the best. It's always so wonderful to, to have these conversations. I think Maddie and I curate our, our guests very well. <laughs> uh, with all the energy and if I may say so myself uh, with all the energy and optimism and just such incredible insights so thank you thank you for being here today thank you for all that you've shared uh, Maddie you're always the best it's such a pleasure to be along your side and and to all of our listeners I hope you enjoy this episode and we can't wait to see you on the next one And we
Very <laughs> I'm like, look, so, I'm so at that for everybody, button. usually we, yeah, we usually we exchange pleasantries and, you know, talk about our weeks and weekends. I don't know what day is it today, Tuesday, we can start away, <laughs> talk about our weeks. But um, I know there's, there's been some notes in the chat um, in a couple of different places. If anybody else has anything else they'd want to add, like, please let us know. Um, it is just always, I, I feel like Maddie and I had this idea to do this podcast in some way we like, I don't know, struck a gold mine because it's so fun and it's, there's just so much to be figured out. And I think I, you know, we bring up more questions and answers sometimes, but it, it, it's, <laughs> it's fun to even like, yeah, always to have this like brainstorm and these insights, you know, through, through the conversation. And no matter how many times like we prepare for the episode, something new comes up like, wait, hold on, we hadn't thought about this or what about this spin or, or you know, some of the comments like really help us. So um, we'll stay for another couple of minutes. We went, so this might be one of our longest episodes yet. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> I know, we, we are pretty passionate about this topic, right? So yeah, we, we, we could have yeah, think... for a couple more hours. Oh, for sure. Guille, I think in uh, in the podcast description, you might have to like write like, you know, please listen to this one. We promise you it's worth it. It's definitely not, you know, the two or three hours that some of the celebrities are doing, but we tend to stay on the shorter side. But there was just so much to say and so much to think about. And, and I think that it's, you know, we can never have enough of these conversations because there's so much to do. So the more we can bring up different viewpoints, different data points, I think hopefully you know, if one person listens and something different clicks in their mind and and all of us have the ability to make the change, all of us have the ability as individuals to decide what's important to us, how do we impact those around us? And, you know, for some people that are in departments where they can make the change in an even greater scale, I think that's even, even more fun and such a, you know, great responsibility, but all of us have the ability to to shape the future so that's why like these are conversations are so fun because they're relevant to everyone <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter like what background you have or where you're you know what country you're sitting in or what mm -hmm. city all of us i feel like can do something with it yeah i actually i really love the way that we're able to to take um or to get some data points that are fresh um and obviously it's a you know relatively small pool it's you know couple of few hundred respondents, but it's still like we're testing our own assumptions. And we've definitely had some data that wasn't what we expected. Um, and it, then that's always really interesting to dig in and say, well, yeah. you know, why did people respond like this when, you know, everything, everybody talks about them responding the opposite way or whatever. But it's a nice way for us to test our own thinking, you know, around all this stuff. Yeah. 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 These are, these Next time great. we might have to do a, a sneak peek of the instant answers so everybody can see how we get those oh, yeah. insights so quickly. <laughs> yes, because it's super cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Is I know. Cool. I was definitely, speaking of technology and, and getting answers for wherever people are, right? Like, that's, yes, you need to show that. That is pretty exciting. <laughs> I know that'll be our next. I'll be that'll be our hook for the next one. And to me, like I ever since I joined Question Pro, it's been like one of my favorite the the Slack integration with our you know market research platform has been just my favorite thing in the world. Thank you, Tim and Dan, if you're on. Um, you guys have changed my life and our life on this show. Um, but it's so fun to like I've I've never been in a role or in a position where I can think about like what you were saying, like oh I wonder what people would say. And then it's funny because sometimes I, I'll think like. Maybe we didn't ask that, right? Okay, let me reword it. It's the same answer. <laughs> like, yeah. Or hmm, maybe 300 is not quite a big enough sample. Let's widen it. Oh, it's the same. Or sometimes we'll say, oh, maybe people didn't get this. And it's, um, it is just this incredible opportunity to have a conversation with people at scale and be able to understand like what's going on in the media, understand some of the whys. Like we've asked so many different questions with different options and just to try to understand. Um, I... I don't have a ton of experience in media, but I was, I did have a journal. I was in a journalist club when I was in high school, <laughs> many moons ago. Um, but, and so I know that, you know, even just from our training and PR and communications, a lot of times there is a, you know, science around what kind of headlines work and mm -hmm. there's a science around the fear. And so I think sometimes just being able to filter that and really understand like what are, you know, different publications, publishing, why is it really that way? How can we take a positive spin on it? If something, you know, it's 
unfortunately, the world is not always beautiful. Um, but even in the most challenging times, it allows us to get some of the insights to understand maybe how can we act on it? Or when the situation is so difficult, what's maybe even a small thing that we can do that would make a difference? Like, how do we understand this better to take action? So it's it's just so fun to be able to, to do that in a really dynamic way to, to get those insights and answers. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody, you've been quiet. You've been an amazing audience. Thank you um, for all for the different chatters throughout. If we were pretty much right up at an hour, so I don't see any new questions coming up. Thank you so very much for joining us. Again, we publish these episodes once every two weeks. Usually we don't do behind the scenes, but if anyone's, if anyone's looking to join us, send Maddie and I a note, even as a guest, maybe. Um, if you're Absolutely. looking to learn more about what we do, let us know. Uh, but it was just really a pleasure to share this space with you. Artie, thank you so much. This was so fun, so valuable. Thank you for having me. Um, just a pleasure to be here with everybody. So thank you, Artie. Thank you, Maddie. Always thank you, Gia, behind the scenes. Always and forever. Um, <laughs> and to everyone who joined us for this session today. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and we'll see you soon. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.